Good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, I will take this opportunity to welcome each and every person who has come today and may you feel that you are in the presence of our God. And uh, those who are visiting for the first time, I also welcome you. May you feel that you are in the uh, presence of God and may you uh, be blessed uh, as you worship with us uh, today. Uh, it's now time for uh, announcements. Uh, the first announcement, uh, there will be a, a work B tomorrow at uh, Flag Mountain. Uh, so they are requesting whoever uh, can make there to uh, go and help. Uh, that will be 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, another announcement, uh, the children ministry, they are requesting members who can donate uh, for the VBS program. Uh, if you can uh, donate something small for our children, please uh, do that. Um, and there is uh, uh, some people who need uh, some help. If you have anything you can help, uh, like bed, love seat, a sofa, sleeping bag, please uh, see and for that. Um, another announcement, uh, there is a survey which is going on. Uh, as we were told last week, all of us have uh, smartphones. You can scan this and do the survey and a draw will be done. One person, if you will be lucky, you will get uh, $20 and a church which will have most surveys will get a $100 uh, gift certificate. So please, let's uh, go ahead and do the survey so that we can get that $100. Uh, uh, the camp meeting will, uh, the Dakota camp meeting will start on 9th through 12th. Uh, so it's a high time for us to uh, plan to attend the camp meeting. The camp meeting is usually in uh, Bismarck, so it's high time for us to uh, prepare for the camp meeting. Uh, I will invite Anne for an announcement. Happy Sabbath. Um, as far as that list, for we have a church member that her husband just passed away not too long ago. She's moving into a new apartment. They have nothing, basically. And um, pastor is supposed to get me a list. But right now they're saying that uh, mom needs a bed. I guess she has no bed. And uh, sofa, uh, table something like that. So if you want to uh, give a love offering, uh, we could probably, uh, you know, get vouchers and uh, get these people, you know, something like at the Salvation Army or something. Um, but if you want to donate something, just let me know or let Pastor Darren know, and we can set something up for that. Um, as also, that uh, Tuesday, we, I don't know what time, Pastor just mentioned it to me. Uh, we need help moving her from the place she's in now into this new apartment. And uh, so if anybody on Tuesday could possibly help, then uh, I, what I'd say is give uh, Pastor Darren a call because he's setting the whole thing up. So, and about the children's ministry thing, 
uh, if somebody does not have a smartphone, I have s some uh, of the forms printed out and it's back on the table. So if they want to do it that way, just give those forms to Kelly. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, it's, now, it's now time for an opening prayer as we start our worship service. Let's pray. Our prayer God in heaven. It's another fine moment, Lord, we come unto you. We thank you, Lord, because you are good to us. Thank you, Father, because you protected us throughout the week. Until now, we are in the Holy Sabbath, Lord. As we worship you, Lord, we pray that may you be with us. May you send your Holy Spirit to guide us uh, through our worship service, Lord. And Lord, as you uh, prepare your children for their second kingdom, we pray that all of us who are seated here today, we will be among the people welcoming you in the midst of the clouds, Lord. May you be with us, Lord, as we start until we finish, for we pray, for we pray believing and trusting in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, it's now time for offerings, and our offering today is for the camp development. Uh, I will read something before we uh, pray and collect the offerings. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? He asked Jacob. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. According to the North America Division Camp Ministry, Camp Ministry Officer Research, summer camps have a significant impact on the religious life of staff, campers, and their families. 54% of baptisms that have occurred in the Dakota in the five years have come from uh, youth and young adults. The majority of these number, number being baptisms that came about because of camp number being camp ministry, sorry. The spirituality uh, that staffers and campers gain at camp deeply influence their identity as children of God as well as influence the children, uh, the direction their lives are going. We are asked that uh, we partner with the, uh, we partner and support the camp ministry. God has graciously gifted us children and we have an incredible means in our hands for them to know their God. So we are requested to uh, partner with the campers uh, so that we can help our children uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the children camps. Let's have a word of prayer as we collect the tithes and offerings. Our kind and loving master above, we thank you, Lord, because uh, you are a good God. And thank you, Lord, because you always uh, bless us as uh, your children. Lord, we thank you because uh, we are going now to give tithes and offerings, Lord. And Lord, I pray that those who are giving today, may you bless them so that they can continue giving and supporting uh, your work, Lord. Those who don't have, Lord, we pray that may you bless them so that they can give next uh, time. We pray, believing and trusting them of Jesus Christ. Amen.
time for a children's story, and I will uh, uh, invite Jennifer to come and give the children's story. Good morning, boys and girls. I have a story to you, uh, for you this morning about a boy named Kenny. And Kenny woke up in the morning and he was pretty excited because his father was out riding on the range and he was left in charge of doing a lot of the farm chores around the house, around the barn. And he kind of liked doing that. Even though it was work, he kind of liked doing it. So um, his mom called him to breakfast and just as she called him to breakfast, the phone rang and she picked it up and she said, oh sure, we can look after Ralph while you go to the dentist. And all of a sudden, Kenny thought in his mind, Ralph, we're going to look after Ralph. Ralph's not my favorite person. I don't enjoy being around Ralph because Ralph kind of complains about a lot of things and he's just kind of a pain in the neck. But, and he was about to tell his mom this, but she asked him to pray for the breakfast meal and he just didn't feel like telling her about it after he prayed. So he thought, well, maybe I'll try to understand Ralph a little bit better today. Well, Ralph came over, and Kenny had to do all these chores. And Ralph's saying, why do you have to always feed something? He said, well, the chickens have got to eat, and the horses have got to eat. So he was feeding the chickens, and then he put the grain out for the horses, and then he had to go water the garden, and then he had to walk down to the mailbox and put some letters in the mailbox for his mom and lift the little flag up. And he got all that done, and Ralph was following him around saying, man, that's a lot of work. It'd take me a whole week to get all that done. And then you got to do it all again this evening. And poor Kenny in his mind was thinking, oh, i got to put up with this complaining, griping Ralph all day today. Besides that, Ralph always liked to hike, and Kenny was kind of tired after his chores, but Ralph wanted to go for a hike. So they went back into the house, and Mom had actually already prepared a nice lunch for them. She had lemonade and some egg salad sandwiches and some other cookies and things. And they started off down towards a place called Hanging Rock. And as they were walking, Ralph said, Boy, I sure hope your mom packed enough in this lunch. Kenny said, My mom always packs enough in the lunch. I don't know why you're complaining about it. And then they got to Hanging Rock. And they were going to take the trail up to Hanging Rock. And all of a sudden, Ralph said, oh, it's a long way up there. And Kenny thought, well, maybe he's not going to want to go up there. But he decided that he would go ahead and go up there. He started heading up there. And he said, we might as well start what we, finish, what we set out to do. And um, Kenny said, yeah, we might see some beautiful, go beautiful God's creation. And Ralph said, you always bringing God into everything. Why do you always got to bring God into everything? Well, the boys got about halfway up, and then they heard this whirring sound. And then they heard it again, and then they looked up on a rock ledge just above them, and there was a rattlesnake. And they didn't know what they were going to do, but Kenny decided that he would pray. And he asked God to protect them. He said, Lord, there's a rattlesnake up there. We can't go further. We really can't make much of a move, because if we do, that rattlesnake's going to strike us. Please protect us. And Kenny was done with his prayer, and all of a sudden, there was another rumbling sound from the top of the mountain. And there was a rumbling, 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 and they looked up, and all of a sudden, they saw this huge rock heading what seemed to be straight towards them. And the rock tumbled down and tumbled down and tumbled down. And all of a sudden, that rock landed on that ledge where that snake was. And, and actually, the snake was smashed underneath that rock. So God had answered Kenny's prayer in a very strange way. And, and 
Kenny was able to witness to Ralph about how God looks after us and cares for us. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. Well, certainly Kenny called on God when he was in trouble, and God delivered him. And you know what? Ralph actually glorified God after that happened. He said, you know, maybe there is something to praying to your God for protection, for watch care. So Kenny was able to witness to him in that way. Um, next time you're in trouble, you can call on God, and he will deliver you, and then you can glorify him. So God bless you. time to uh, give praises to our God and uh, prayer requests. Is there anyone who wants to, uh, who has a prayer request or praises? Another prayer request? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Let's pray. Our precious God in heaven, Lord, we come unto you. We thank you, Father, because you are our Father. We thank you because of your love. We thank you because of your grace, which has made us see this time, Lord. Lord, we thank you because we are your children, Lord. We come unto this morning, Lord, asking that may you be with us in a special way. Lord, as you move around blessing your children, we pray that all of us who are seated here, may you be with us and may you bless us, Lord. Lord, this morning, we remember those who are suffering throughout the world 
may you be with them in a special way. May you move closer to them, Lord, and may you, uh, may you reduce the sufferings, Lord, they are going through, Lord. There are those who are sick, Lord, we pray that may you stretch your healing hand, touch them so that they can get better, and your name will be glorified, Lord. This morning, Lord, we remember uh, the children who are missing around uh, uh, rapid seat, Lord. May you be with them, Lord, in a special way. Lord, wherever they are, we pray that may you uh, protect them, Lord. And we pray that, Father, may you uh, make their, uh, uh, their parents, their relatives, Lord, so that they can find them, Lord, and may they return safely, and your name will be glorified, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are having health issues, Lord. May you be with them, Father. May you stretch your hand, Lord, touch them so that they can get better, and your name will be glorified, Lord. We remember uh, Phyllis, Lord, who is having uh, healthy problems, Lord. May you be with her in a special way. May you, Lord, uh, heal her as you heal your children, Lord. May you give all that you give your children, Lord, so that she can get better, Lord. Lord, we remember uh, one, uh, uh, one person who graduated from our church school, Lord. May you be with uh, her in a special way, Lord. May you continue helping her as she goes ahead with her studies, Lord. Lord, may you be with us in a special way. This morning, Lord, I remember our speaker who is going to speak to us today. Lord, may you be with him. May you speak through him in a special way, Father. Continue being with us, Lord, until we finish. And Lord, let us move uh, several steps towards you as we finish our service today, Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for special music, and I will uh, request Ariel to come for special music. Thank you so much, Ariel, uh, for that wonderful music. Our scripture reading today comes from uh, the book of Matthew. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Uh, the Bible says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find, find it. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. Uh, you, things have changed, though. Last time I was here, you were in another church. So it's been a little while, yeah. I, I was on a tour with my wife last time we came through here. It must have been, what, seven, eight years ago, something like that? Uh, I think they were putting a new roof on the other church uh, at that time. And uh, I've been touring a little bit around the country, not as much as we did before COVID. And uh, in fact, 
I, I just did an event not too long ago. It was over in Indianapolis, Indiana. And the church, I, I did the sermon on the Sabbath, then we did an event on Sunday. And the church was renting out their church to a Sunday church on Sundays. And uh, of course, I got to get in there and get the cooking done and get everything taken care of. And I knew they had this Sunday church coming in. So I try to get all my cooking done ahead of time. Uh, so I'm not interfering with their Sunday service. And the pastor and his wife from the Sunday church come in really early. And, uh, and I wasn't quite done yet. And uh, so I'm kind of like, oh man, I got to get things done. And, and uh, the pastor's wife from the Sunday church, she comes in the kitchen and she starts getting her uh, communion ready for their Sunday service. And, and we started talking a little bit. And, and she says, yeah, I heard about you. You teach health and nutrition and do cooking things all over the country. And, and, uh, and we're talking a little bit. And, and I said, yeah, we've done this for free. We've done this at over you know, 1,500 locations uh, around the world. And, uh, and she says, you've never charged? You don't charge people to come to these events or anything? And, and I said, no. And she says, that's just wonderful that you're able to do this and help people like that. And I said, after all, we're all Adventists. And she looks at me and she says, oh, I'm not an Adventist. And I said, well, by definition... The word Adventist means anticipating Christ's soon return. And I said, are you anticipating Christ's soon return? She says, well, yeah. And I said, well, then you're an Adventist. She says, well, I guess I am. <laughs> you know, most people just don't even understand the definition of the word. And if you'll simply just explain the definition of the word, now you kind of have common ground. So it's able to uh, take that moment and reason together. So... Amen. Uh, I, I'll tell you, I have got one of the most eye-opening, thought-provoking sermons you are ever going to have today. So I've got to start with prayer. I'm going to think I'm just going to set this right here. And I'm going to put my keys with it because I am not going to leave without my Bible. So <laughs> now I know I can't leave. Um, but yes, let me start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us to celebrate and worship you. And we humble ourselves before you, Lord. Uh, we do ask for the forgiveness of our sins, and, and we know you're a righteous and just God who has paid the ultimate price. You have forgiven our sins. and We just want to be worthy of being in your presence in this holy home that you have provided for us. And we just ask that you're with us. Use me as I surrender to you to be the words that need to be spoken today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, the sermon title is The Sin of Democracy. And people look at this like, what kind of a nutty title is this? Who could have possibly come up with a, a sermon called The Sin of Democracy? Uh, but I'm not here to be politically correct, okay? Because political correctness usually means biblical incorrectness. In fact, political correctness means you're not supposed to talk about politics from the pulpit. And you're not supposed to talk about biblical issues anywhere. That's what political correctness is. It's all about silencing God's word. In fact, we should actually have biblical correctness. Maybe that should be the key words that get out there in a heavier way. Let's have biblical correctness. Uh, in fact, in these last days, just look at the issues that are biblical issues that have turned into political issues. Gay marriage, marriage itself, abortions, parenting is a political issue. Drugs, education is a political issue. Uh, creation versus evolution, healthcare and welfare, even tithing is now becoming a political issue. There are organizations out there that truly believe that your tithing dollars needs to go to the government and not the church because it's the government who's paying for all these social benefits that the church used to do. So they think this way. And look, this is not a political sermon, okay? But if you're a member, if your party is the Democrat party, you're not going to like this sermon, and if your party is the Republican Party, if that's your devout 
connection as the Republican Party, you're not going to like this sermon. But if you're a member of God's party, you're going to love this sermon. That's the party we need to be involved with. Councils for the Church, page 316, says God's children are to separate themselves from politics. From any alliance with unbelievers, do not take part in political strife. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 477. Those teachers in the churches or the schools who distinguish themselves by their zeal in politics should be relieved of their work and responsibility without delay. The Lord will not cooperate with them. And you got so many people that are taking these political lines and then you wonder why the Lord is not cooperating with them. We need to stay away from the political alliances. And if anybody has ever seen any of my sermons, you know I'm quite a word person. I really study words, definitions, Greek and Hebrew. And, and uh, so a lot of times you can just take a word and break down the word and you can really get the meaning of it. Well, politics, just break down the word, poly means many. Tix means parasites. So politics actually means many parasites. That's what the definition of the word is. Many parasites. So, uh, no, wait, I, I guess I better give you the actual definition, right? Okay. Here's the actual definition of the word politics. Your beliefs, how a country ought to be governed. Number two, the art of compromise. And number three, the debate or conflict among individuals or parties having or hoping to achieve power. Now, none of these definitions actually show any godly characteristics. Your beliefs, how a country ought to be governed, what about God's beliefs, values, and principles? The art of compromise? God is not a God of compromise. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen? And as far as achieving power, that's all about self. Even if it's party, it's about that party's self. It's not about godly power and recognizing the true authority of the universe. So, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, don't vote. Sometimes there's times you need to vote on an issue or something like that. But are you voting on a political issue or are you voting on a liberal issue or a conservative issue or a worldly issue? It would probably be the better word for that. And of course, voting, usually, one of the bad things about voting is it creates division. Because you always have a loser. Take the kids and tell them, hey, we're going to go out for ice cream, but you've got to vote where we're going to go. And you'll have some strife going on. And then when you get there, you, you tell the kids, they all have to vote on the same type of ice cream. Oh, you'll have anarchy going on. <laughs> You'll have temper tantrums. <laughs> I mean, just vote on what color the carpet's going to be in here and see what happens. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens. Uh, uh, so biblically, there's usually nothing to vote on. If, if, if you look at what God wants, usually you come up with such an obvious answer. Um, now, when I grew up, uh, just to let you know, I did grow up here in the Black Hills. I went to high school in Hill City, um, you know, South Dakota. That's my home state. I was born here. And, uh, of course, I was not interested in politics when I was growing up. Uh, political party, yeah, I was more interested in other types of parties. Uh, if you know my history uh, in Las Vegas as well, um, I just wasn't interested in political parties. But of course, the older I got, the more I started looking at political parties, and the more I was seeing good things in both political parties, so, which was very intriguing, but then I was looking at the bad things in these political parties. And I was like, man, I just can't be a part of these bad things that, that these parties are, are involved in. And so I'd done more and more homework. God was like telling me to study this out when it comes to politics and, and the way the world is right now. And so the more I studied it, the more I realized that in today's society, democracy is one of the major problems 
that we have in this world today. And most people are like, how can that be? Democracy is so wonderful. Democracy used to be so wonderful. Not so much today. Now, we know democracy has done a lot of good in society over the years, right? I can really understand that how much good democracy has done. But if you look at both political parties, both political parties say, we are fighting for our democracy. And both political parties are saying, the other side is trying to rob us of our democracy. I'm like, how could they both be saying the exact same thing? So I started studying it more and more. And I looked at this and I said, is democracy really freedom? Is democracy even godly? That's when I said, I've got to go to the Bible for answers. Amen? We've got to go to the Bible for answers. First of all, let me give you the definition, the official definition of the word democracy, because most of you probably don't even know it. And most of you probably don't even come close to understanding what democracy is. This is the official Webster Dictionary definition of democracy. Number one, a government by the people, especially the rule of the majority. So basically put, democracy means majority rules. That's it. That's the definition of democracy. Majority rules. Number two, a political unit that has a democratic government. United States. Majority rules. That's the democratic government. That's what we're at. And the third definition of democracy, if it's capitalized, it's the principles and policies of the Democrat Party of the United States. Regardless of morality, regardless of principles, regardless of ethics, and regardless of godly character. Whatever the majority wants, they get. That's what democracy means. If the majority says, hey, it's okay to steal kids' bikes, then hey, it's okay to steal kids' bikes. If the majority says, it's okay to have pedophile conduct, it's okay to do that, which there are counties in this country that allow pedophilia because a majority has deemed that's what we want in our society. That's democracy because majority rules. Well, that doesn't sound too good. You got to understand something about America. We were not established as a democracy 100%. We were also established as a republic with a set of biblical standards and principles that must be adhered to in order for that democracy to take place. Sean Boonstra did a really good series last year all about the, the foundation of America and where most of the uh, principles in America in, in, was actually from Deuteronomy. And a lot of the things about, you know, how long a president can run a term and have to be, you know, from the U.S. soil and different things. I mean, a lot of that came from Deuteronomy. So, uh, really good to maybe check that one out. But anyway, the point I've got to make here is that, is there anybody here that actually believes that we have a more godly country now than we did 250 years ago? Absolutely not. So democracy would work very well if the majority of the people are godly people. You look at the Declaration of Independence, you look at a lot of the early, even presidents, they were pastors and priests that were really signers of the Declaration and everything. We had a huge majority that were godly people. But it's getting worse and worse. In fact, nowadays, the majority of the people are not biblically centered people. The majority of the people nowadays are too busy playing video games, kill, 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 and watching movies, satanic movies, uh, TV that's just clouding their brains. They're so busy doing all these other things instead of studying the Bible and praying and listening to God's word. Leo Tolstoy, 
known as the world's greatest author, obviously to people who don't know the author of the Bible, but this is Leo Tolstoy's quote, wrong does not cease to be wrong because the majority share in it. See, what happened was a bait and switch. We took the bait of democracy because it was such a wonderful thing because we had a godly majority. But then the switch took place. And now we're in a democracy where the majority are ungodly. This is the bait and switch. Democracy works great when you've got a majority of intelligent, godly people. But the switch took place. It happened pretty slow, so we didn't notice it. But that's where we are today. In fact, here's a Gallup polls, 2018. 48% of the population in America do not go to church at all, ever. 48%. In fact, over the last 10 years, regular attendance of churchgoers has dropped from 42 to 38%. And in the last 20 years, churchgoers has dropped over 10%. Now, there's two other studies from independent people that came up with the same numbers on this next study here. And it shows that the actual, um, on any given week, only 17% of the population actually attend a church service. That's it, 17%. And with COVID, you might as well just drop that down to 7%. Or less. And the latest study, this is from the Barna Group last year, a Barna Group study states that Bible centered adults has dropped from 9% to 5% in one year. So, actual Bible studied, you know, Bible based population in America is down to 5%. Woo! That's not a majority, is it? That is a really bad situation that we're getting ourselves into right now. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap for themselves teachers, having itchy ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth. 2 Timothy 3.13 but evil men and seducers shall, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's what we're heading. We're, in, we're heading into this domino effect of people who are not biblically centered. And so the question was, you know, is there democracy in heaven? Is there democracy in the Bible? And so we want to go to the Bible. We want to study what the Bible says. And first, first of all, the thing you got to understand is that God is a dictator. All right, that got silent in here. You got to get this. Yes, God is a dictator. Let's first go through the definitions of the word dictator, huh? That, that would always be a good place to start because people are looking at me funny. You got to get this. These are actual definitions this is the American English Dictionary. Word for word, definitions of the word dictator. Number one, a magistrate with supreme authority. That sounds like God, doesn't it? Number two, a ruler with absolute power and authority. Well, that sounds like God too. Number three, one whose pronouncements on some subject are meant to be taken as the final word. That's God too. And their fourth definition, there's only four here. The fourth definition, a person who dictates words for another one to write down. Well, God does that too. He instructed them to write the Bible. He talked to John at Patmos. God is a dictator. But he's a good dictator, a loving dictator, a benevolent dictator. Now, there are bad dictators out there, right? We've got to admit there are bad dictators. But see, Satan wants you to believe that dictators are evil. Because if you believe dictators are evil, then you have to 
hate the biggest dictator of the universe, which is God. Who dictates where the stars are going to be in the sky? Who dictates what's going to happen with the sun's solar flares? Who dictates how the earth is going to turn? Who dictates to the angels to come down to our aid? You know, if you look at reality, every school teacher is a dictator. Dictating what goes on in that classroom. Every business owner is a dictator. Dictating what goes on in that business. Every parent needs to be a dictator. Saying, no, we are not going to watch these kind of movies in our household. In fact, the worst parents are the ones who don't dictate anything. We've got to understand these things. If you want to be more Christ-like, you need to be more of a solid dictator, like Christ being a loving, caring, benevolent dictator, but still standing on biblical truth. Amen? Amen. But let's, I got to get back to the biblical lesson, though, on democracy. I'll, I'll, I'll start running on a whole other sermon there. Um, <sighs> democracy, okay. So the, what we have to look at is the Bible. What does the Bible say? Now, when it comes to heaven, when Satan was riling up all the people in heaven, he was gathering more people and more people on his side, Satan was trying to create democracy in heaven. Now, he got up to one-third of the angels, deceived them, got him on his side. He was trying to get to that 51%. And God says, no, no, no. This is not a democracy in heaven. And he cast Satan and those fallen angels out of heaven when there was only a third of them. And that's where the, the, the entire great controversy begins, the trial between good and evil that is being played out before us. And Satan has been trying to create democracy ever since here on earth that's all he's been doing he wants that majority so i'm going to give you some examples here and i'll start out with some easy ones okay so you can all kind of get on page here noah and the flood who perished was it the majority or the minority who perished the majority perished and the minority was saved how about sodom and gomorrah who perished? Was it the majority or the minority? Majority. And the minority were saved. Time and time again. You're going to see this over and over in the Bible. How the democracies, the majority rules. Uh, and that, that'd be enough right there for you to understand. You know, how democracy is not in the Bible. But there's more. In Christ's day, Pontius Pilate was the one person who could have let Christ go. But here comes the backlash of the majority saying, crucify him, crucify him. Remember that? Now, that's actually what you would call a mob rule. That's, that's the mob rule mentality. You get a mob that just says, crucify him, crucify him. And that's what they did. Boycotts, form of mob rule. Union strikes is mob rule. You got social internet sites that are being taken over by mob rule trying to do a silence culture. You know, that's mob. That, that is mob mentality to silence people because of their beliefs. That's majority rules. That's democracy. The majority says, we need to shut off your Twitter account. We're going to shut off your Twitter account. That's what happens. Mob rule, making the decisions. Well, now every time this happens, though, there is a seed planner. Mostly Satan. He's the one planting the seeds, riling up the people to have this outcry that creates the mob rule mentality. But let's, uh, we're, I'm going to go to John 11:49 because we're still back in Christ's day here. And John 11:49 had a seed planter as well. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. Do you not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the entire nation perish? So they already had the seed planters to make sure that Christ was going to die on the cross. And of course, even though the world didn't know it at the time, 
that was our greatest blessing that, you know, he did die on the cross. Um, now, there are other examples, too. How about the golden calf in the wilderness, huh? Aaron, his leadership was completely overrun by democracy, by the mob, the majority rules. The Tower of Babel. Once again, Satan trying to create that democracy, trying to create that majority rules. And God's like, no, 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 and he broke it up. God always stands for the minorities who stand with him. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were definitely the minority, weren't they? God stood right through them, even through the fire. Gideon in the 300. Boy, they were on God's side. They were up against 135,000 troops. And the 300 prevailed. Once again, God taking sides with the minority. And so, if you look at, uh, how about Joshua and Caleb? You know the story about Joshua and Caleb? It's in Numbers. Uh, the 12 spies that went in to check out the promised land, right? And these were leaders of the churches, by the way. 12 leaders of the 12 tribes that went into the promised land. They even came back with the bounty. They came back with the proof that it was the promised land that God had promised them. And only two of them said, we can take this land. The other 10 actually wanted to stone Moses and Caleb and, and kill them and go back to Egypt. That's what they wanted to do. I'm sure hoping in these end days that we have more than two out of every 12 of our leaders staying convicted to the promised land that God has set forth in front of us. Yeah, I mean, but it was two, just two out of those people. So we've got to be the minority. Now, there are a couple more key phrases I want to share with you real quick here when it comes to democracy, because it's being masqueraded in different ways. But you're going to see the similarities. Political correctness, that is a form of controlling majority rules. What, what political correctness officially means is what is socially acceptable. But who's to decide what is socially acceptable? The majority. Social justice, another one of those words you got to watch out for. Justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. But who's to determine? It's the majority. You can go through the same thing when it comes to inclusion, to diversity, which I think is ridiculous. Diversity, especially in our church, because we're the most diverse church of any church on the entire planet. We should be the example <laughs> as to how diversity works. I mean, uh, and every one of these, human right is another one. Human justice is another one. And they use these words and they'll put the word justice or equality in their key tag words in order to provoke you into thinking it's something that it's not. It's used to portray a persona of good when actually they're political pawns for the majority rule movement. Even communism and socialism are forms of democracy. Absolutely. They are designed to use fear as their controlling agent to make sure that the majorities stay in line with the agenda. That's the way that works. Uh, so, you know, you got to watch out for those. Fear keeps them in order. Even unity. Unity is actually one of the biggest evil forces of majority rules. And we hear unity, unity all over the country, all over the world today, how we need unity. Now, we think of having unity in our church, which is something we need, amen? But worldly unity is going to be a huge problem because it's in alliance with democracy, majority rules. Pope Francis, Pope, in fact, the last couple of popes have been really strong on this. 
the key word is for the common good. Everything is for the common good. And uh, here's uh, Pope Francis. Uh, this is May 2019. Uh, calling for a global common good. He has used this phrase hundreds of times. NBC News on September 25th, the Pope was quoted, if you are not doing what is for the common good, you are barbaric. That's the quote. If you're not doing what is for the common good, then you are barbaric. You know, even with the vaccines. You know, vaccines should be a right to privacy. Not you better do it for the common good. If you want to do a vaccine or don't do a vaccine, that's your business. You know, it's a, it's a HIPAA violation to even ask somebody if they've been vaccinated. You know, what happened to the right to privacy? You know, what I, they don't ask me how many sodas I've had with 20 pounds of sugar every day or something. But anyway, <clears throat> let's face it, the majority rules democracy is now just getting more and more and more wicked. Majority rules supports gay marriage. Even though less than 2% of the population is actually gay. Majority rules supports abortions. Even though only one out of every 200 women have ever had an abortion. That's very rare when you look at the global level. Here in America it's a lot higher, but, but on a global level, you know, it's just unheard of. You know, abortions, by the way, if you know anything about Roe versus Wade, abortions was a right to privacy issue. Had nothing to do with the rights of that child. It was all about the right to privacy. And that's where we stood on that. And I do have the official statement here from the Seventh-day Adventist Church when it comes to uh, abortions. And... The official stand of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that we are against abortions. Now, there are six categories here, and each one of these categories on this four-page actually has about a half a dozen scriptures backing up each one of these categories. Uh, number one, God upholds the value and sacredness of human life. Number two, God considers the unborn child as human life. Uh, number three, the will of God regarding human life is expressed in the Ten Commandments and explained by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Number four, God is the owner of life and human beings are his stewards. Number six, the Bible teaches care for the weak and vulnerable, including the unborn. Number seven, six, sorry, God's grace promotes life in a world marred by sin and death. So, if you support abortions, it's not the church that needs to change its principles. It's not the Bible that needs to change its principles. It's not God that needs to change its principles. It's you that needs to look in the mirror and find out why you think that way. You know, and, and it is what it is. You know, same thing with gay marriage. You know, it's not God that needs to change his definition of marriage. It's not the Bible that needs to change its definition. Society decided, you know what, let's just change the definition. Even though the Bible clearly states that it's between a man and a woman, you know, the whole principle, and we need to raise the bar. We need to raise our standards. Not think that God needs to lower his standards to what our desires are. And look, if you're experiencing gay tendencies, you're welcome here. If you've had an abortion, you're welcome here. I don't think of that as being different than any other sin. If you're a liar, you're welcome here. If you're an adulterer, you're welcome here. If you're a thief, you're welcome here. This is where God transforms people's lives. Every one of us has been transformed in one way or another, and every one of us still needs more transformation. You know, this is, and just the fact, you, this might be your first time in this church, it might be the first time you're ever watching. God will transform your life based on your willingness to be transformed. 
You know, the more you surrender to God's will, the more he's going to be able to transform you. This is where we get transformed. And it doesn't happen in a day. It doesn't happen in a week. It takes time. Most people want everything done in the microwave. God is the master of marinating. Some things take time. You know, especially when you went through years of, of going down the wrong path like I did. It took a little time for God to get me turned around and go the path I was supposed to be on. You know, but this is where it happens. Don't give up. That's all I'm saying. Don't give up. Oh, anyway, these are a lot of the sins of democracy that I'm talking about. Have you all ever taken a poll? Polls is a form of trying to figure out what the majority wants. Majority rules. Let's take a poll, see what the majority wants. There's polls on what movies are going to make the most money. There's polls on every different type of thing. Churches have polls, mega churches back in Vegas. I'd have these polls that come by, and they would, if they're going to build a mega church like they did the one in Vegas, they put polls out there to determine what type of music was most popular. So that's the kind of music they played. What colors were most popular? That's the colors they used for the entire scheme of the church. You know, that's what they do. Here's a, uh, one of those polls. And this one here, you'll find pretty interesting. Uh, and these are the questions. And there's some different uh, rates you can put on things. But here's one of the questions on the polls. I prefer sermons that are biblical and Christ-centered. Really? You have to ask that? And if the majority does not want sermons that are biblical and Christ-centered, you got it. That's what's going on. This is from a church. Wants to know what, what kind of church you want. I want sermons that are comforting. Yeah, just give me fluffy bunny sermons. Okay, you got it. I want a uh, uh, scripture, this is sermon structure. I want um, churches that are affirming my thinking and actions. Really? You better give me what I think or I'm going to go find another restaurant. <laughs> you know, that's the way they treat churches nowadays, right? Just like a restaurant. You get bad service, you go to another one. And uh, I want sermons that address social justice issues. Now, by the way, this was from a seminary who um, was doing a poll. And I talked to the facilitator, and I will quote him word for word, because I asked him, what is the purpose of this survey? And this was his quote. It is to better equip the students to the needs of the community. rather than understand that you need to prepare those pastors you know, for the community, they're, they're twisting it into, let's get them on the page to you know, make happy, fluffy, bunny congregations. But it's just nutty. It's just nutty. But that's the world we live in. Okay, so now we're going to go into the future. We kind of went through the past and biblically, and I want to get to present day here, uh, because here's what's going to happen next. We're going to end up with these super majorities. The Democrat Party is a super majority. Republican Party is a super majority. And there could come a point where they've got some interlocking, interlapping super, super majorities. And, uh, and of course, it's going to be for the common good. And, of course, you know what's going to happen. If you're not part of this majority and super majority, you're not going to be able to buy or sell, Right? You're going to be brought up before the courts for your faith. You could be killed because of your minority belief. This is what's going to be taking place in the very near future. But here's where the sermon rubber meets the road. Okay, And this is in Matthew 24, 12. Because the whole question is how are we going to act or react 
to these things that are going to take place. Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Now most people just read that part of the scripture and they look at the world saying, look at this, look at this whole world is just waxing cold. It's just, oh, it's just a whole horrible, horrible world. They don't read the next sentence. Because this scripture is not for the people out there whose love is wax cold. This scripture is for all of us in here to make sure our love does not wax cold. Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold. 13, here's the T, because, but he who endures till the end shall be saved. This is all about you not letting your love wax cold because of what is going on out in society with the sin of democracy. Do not let your love wax cold when they take you up to the courts. Do not let your love wax cold. When you can't buy or sell, don't let your love wax cold. That breaks your relationship with God. You know Daniel in the lion's den? Daniel was up there praying. He was not going to let his relationship with God be severed. He was not going to let his love wax cold because of what the maturity required. They put him in the lion's den. God protected him. Do not let your love wax cold. Look at the centurion. Remember the centurion who came to Christ and he needed his servant uh, to be healed? God knew that those centurions were going to be sending him off to the cross in a few days. But he did not let his love wax cold to people who were you know, able to be reached. He went and healed that person. Uh, you know Stephen in Acts? Uh, Acts 7, I don't have this one written down here. It's Acts uh, 7, 59 and 60. Stephen, where is he at here? Acts, 50, uh, Acts 7, 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen. And he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And, we, and when he had said that, he fell asleep. So even Stephen was you know, asking for forgiveness for the people who are actually stoning him. That, he did not let his love wax cold. Even Jesus on the cross, looking at the people who nailed him to the cross, is saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when people are attacking you, and charging you, and harassing you and you know everything that they could think of you've got to understand they do not know what they're doing and you're never going to reach somebody if you've got a wall there you cannot let your love wax cold because you will not be able to be a witness for the kingdom if you love waxes cold for everyone that disagrees with you you've got to be able to reason together Okay, the last great act of democracy. We went through the past from when Satan was trying to create democracy in heaven. We went through the New and Old Testament there real quick. We went through the future day, present days and the future days right now, what's going to happen with the majority rules movement. Well, here we go with the last great act of democracy in the history of the universe. That's going to be a thousand years from now. When the wicked rise and Satan riles them up and says, look at this, we've got the super, super, super majority. There are so many more of us than there are of them. We can take that kingdom. And of course, they'll get wiped out in an instant. That will be the last act of democracy in the history of the universe. 
Mount of Blessings, page 138, says you must go with the few, for the multitude will choose the downward path. That's where we're at. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is why I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah, it's the minority, but it's God's minority. The people that have the truth, the biblical correctness, they have the Bible. And only the Bible is the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. And they keep the commandments of God. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, I, I keep his commandments because I want to. You know, and they have the love of Christ in the spirit of, pri uh, of prophecy. And, and that's why I'm a member of this church. Because they keep the commandments of God. So, Amen. Um, I think we have a closing song. Do we have a closing song? Yeah, I think we do, maybe. We do. There we go. 626, and then I'll do a closing prayer. 626. Let's stand. In a little while. Let us, let's go. Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we're going home. For the night will end in the everlasting day In a little while we're going home In a little while, in a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past in a little while we're going home we the work that our hands may find to do in a little while we're going home and the grace of god will our daily strength renew in a little while we're going home in a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while, we're going home. We will smooth the path for some weary wayworn feet in a little while we're going home and may loving hearts spread around an influence sweet in a little while we're going home in a little while in a little while we shall cross the billows foam we shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past in a little while we're going home now for the final verse can i hear the men on the first two lines men let's go Let's join them, ladies. 
And no tear shall fail in the city bright and fair In a little while we're going home In a little while In a little while In a little while We shall cross the billows foam We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past In a little while we're going home Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and gathering us all together. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help keep us in the minority, in the palm of your hands. But there comes a time, Lord, when we've still got to proclaim there's so many more people that haven't heard the truths that we hold dear. And so, so we just ask that you'll help us Make that minority a much bigger minority. You know, because time is so, so short. And we're going to be going home for all eternity. And we can't wait till those trumpets sound. And we pray that you'll teach us not only how to hold this Sabbath as a, a reverence, a day of reverence, uh, but also a day of celebration. Because it is a mirror image of that thousand year Sabbath that you have waiting for us just around the corner when those trumpets sound. In Jesus' name, amen.